In timeless rhythms of the ocean's sway, where waves caress the shore in elegant display. Metaphor unfolds, enchanting and true, for life's ever-changing yet steadfast and blue. With each crest that rise, the world transforms, in fluid motion its essence reforms. But beneath the surface a constant remains, an unwavering presence, unyielding the change. The waves may dance with vigor and might, crashing and receding in the moon's soft light, yet the ocean's heart beats a steadfast drum, eternal and calm, where all things become one. Through ebbs and flows a melody is born, a symphony of whispers, a celestial adorn. For though the tides shift in tumultuous stride, the essence of the sea forever resides. With the ocean's waves life too unfolds, a tapestry of stories and vibrant hues bold. Moments fleet like seagulls in flight, but the core of existence glows with eternal light. Though the cycles of time and cosmic embrace, the soul of creation finds solace and grace. And as we navigate life's tempestuous sea, we find solace in knowing that change sets us free. So let us embrace the waves of life's grand dance. With courage and wisdom, our hearts shall advance. For amidst the chaos, a constancy gleams. In the oceans of existence, where eternity dreams. The waves of the sea constantly crash into the beach surface. They never cease their movement. It's something that is a permanent fixture of this world that we can always rely on to stay constant. And it's ironic, with each and every wave that pounds into the shore, it's almost impossible to tell exactly which particles of sand remain the same from the last strike of the ocean's wrath. And how many of those salty water molecules from the last wash of liquid also exist in the next one? One Piece is something that has always been a part of my life. I've been watching it since the 4 Kids dub was airing on Fox Kids around the same time my brain had just developed the physical capability of forming memories. With this in mind, it's a somber realization that this story is coming to an end. Very soon, in fact, with Aichiro Oda staying somewhat consistent with his breakdowns of how long he expects to continue until it reaches its conclusion. We've been in the midst of the final saga for almost a full year now, and with the constant barrage of reveals, it's impossible to ignore that the secrets of this world are being revealed one after the other. That constant that has remained in our lives for over 25 years is beginning to fleet away. Eventually, there will be one more ebb without a subsequent flow. The moments taken for granted for decades will cease to exist. You won't get a text from your friends saying the scans are on TCB for the latest chapter. You won't get a Shonen Jump notification for the official release to compare to the official translations to the headcanon formed for the last few days due to what may or may not have been improper fan translations. You won't get to see Teking or Joy Boy or Rogers Base reacting to the most recent reveals in the story because there won't be any more reveals. Everything ends, One Piece included. However, the story will persist. We can read it over and over again, reflect on it in new ways with greater insight from where we are currently in our lives, interpret things in ways we haven't before. In fact, that's something I do all the time, even now. In fact, there's an arc of One Piece that I find myself forced to revisit more and more these days. It was never a favorite of mine. In fact, on my first read-through and subsequent watch-through, I wasn't much a fan of it at all. I think it's because it was so separated from the world of One Piece. Although the arc was a blast in isolation, it didn't seem to add much to the story's progression. Skypea is often called a microcosm of the entire story of One Piece. And in a manga that was much less epic in scale, the Skypea arc alone could be its own completed serialized comic from start to finish. What is absolutely clear with One Piece is that there is careful purpose behind every arc's inclusion. Yes, even Long Ring Long Land, come back to me in like a year and a half when Luffy and Shanks are having a daddy bag fight. What I'm talking about here is the realization that a lot of fans have had about all the pre-time skip arcs having a somewhat equivalent arc in the post-time skip as well, playing into the idea of the checkered fate of the D-Clan, or in another way, the ebbs and flows of the ocean waves. However, these always play more into the checkered board motif, with one arc being the lighter version of its darker half. The three that I think are the most clear are Arlong Park and Fishman Island, Little Garden and Punk Hazard, and Alabasta and Dressrosa. There are some that aren't quite as clear, though, and might even be reflections of multiple arcs as one. Wano has clear connections to both Thriller Bark and Marineford, and for the longest time I thought Polkic Island was a conglomerate of Eni's Lobby and Skypea. 
The Undies lobby connections are obvious over Skypea. Well, this arc takes place in that fantastical dream world, and Luffy's final boss is a man who fights with a trident who has really good observation hockey. Whenever I made that connection, though, there was one thing that was strikingly unclear. Where is God on Hulking Island? Skypea has a lot to say about religion and God. Playing into the theme of freedom that is pervasive throughout the entire One Piece story, I think what it's trying to say is that to go out of your way to wrap yourself in rules or traditions that have some sort of obligation rather than your own desire to believe is wrong. If you choose to follow some sort of fellowship on behalf of your own free will, then sure, I'll power to you, but if you do it to appease a parent, society, or even a spiteful god, then you are in a prison against your own will. There are some arguments you can make as to how Big Mom and Hulking Island parallels to Enaru in some ways, but I think the comparison is lacking no matter how hard you try to justify it. No. There's another force that stands in the post-time skip as Enaru's as God's parallel on this strange checkerboard, but we will get to that later. There's this book I read a couple of years ago called House of Leaves that just keeps entering my mind space lately. Within the confines of those infinitely warping pages is something familiar to One Piece. You see, House of Leaves is written in a really strange way. It's a story about a man who found a weird story and is telling you about it, but he had published this retelling with his added narrative, and even the editor at the publishing house decided to put a bit of their narrative into it as well. It's a labyrinthian tale and a monstrous task to even comprehend. The reason I'm bringing it up is that there's this narrative tool utilized that the fans have called Echoes. You see, in House of Leaves, the narrator will tell you about something happening in the story he found, and then something similar yet unremarkable will happen to him the next day. Like, a character in the story will rip a button off of his shirt, and then he would do the same. Each of the narratives being told echo one another. And this is something that I can't also help but see in Skypea. Let me show you what I mean. Also, don't laugh at my narrator impression. <laughs> Deceit, obscurity, powerlessness. The world all laughed at one man, the liar, Monplock No. At his death, the words he spoke drove, co drove countless men to tears of laughter. That's it, the mountain of gold sank into the ocean. And so, men dubbed him as a liar, leaving the great treasure of Shandor, the pursuit of a fool's fantasy. Noland never stopped lying until he was dead. It might sound a little familiar to you. Here, how about if I play this back to it? Wealth, fame, power. Gold Roger, the king of the pirates, attained this and everything else the world had to offer. And his dying words drove countless souls to the seas. You want my treasure? You can have it. I left everything I gathered together in one place. Now you just have to find it. These words lured men to the Grand Line in pursuit of dreams greater than they'd ever dared to imagine. This is the time known as the Great Pirate Era. There's a really interesting parallel between Gold Roger and Mont Blanc Noland. Their stories are true echoes of each other, each falling into a different colored square on that checkered board of fate. Both men lived incredible lives, and both men were true romantics, who were both pure embodiments of freedom, which is the most important theme in the story. Ironically, both men had ceremonious executions where they were forever cemented in history. However, one would be revered as the greatest pirate who ever lived, while the other was a shameful deceiver, reduced to the moral of a children's story by the dangers of telling lies. And the most important thing to remember is that the will of both these men left ripples in the water that we see to the present day in the story. Monplot Cricket is a man who was illogically shackled to the past. Once the captain of a pirate crew who sailed the Grand Line with the utmost freedom, he suddenly became incapable of living that life when faced with the ghost that haunted him. One day at the island of Jaya, where Nolan had said the City of Gold resided, he became unable to progress until he reached a conclusion with his ancestor's alleged lie. He did not care if it existed or not, or to even prove Nolan's innocence. He just decided then to continue doing so, with the ambition that before he died, he would settle the matter once and for all. Montblanc Cricket is the epitome of a romantic. That same will that resided in Roger and Noland also finds itself within him. Those echoes of the past ripple through his blood. He is a man who yearns for discovery, hunting a treasure that might not even exist. However, there is a foil to him on this island. A man who doesn't believe in dreams, who dismisses the fantastic world with what only can be proven with material fact. Bellamy is the mirror to Cricket. Not only mocking his fruitless quest for the City of Gold, but also laughing at Luffy's desire to visit the Sky Island. Cricket may believe he lives freely, but he is a prisoner of a force he cannot entirely rationalize. Bellamy also believes he lives freely, yet still has his own shackles. 
doesn't aspire to achieve a dream, his greatest pursuit is to impress a single person he admires. Which is why both these men were always destined to fail. And when Bellamy encounters someone who lives their life without a semblance of restraint, it's of course the one without any shackles in this world that is victorious. This of course happens once again when the rest of Bellamy's crew encounter Luffy's Echo, the man who wants all the same things as Luffy, but goes about it in his own anarchist way. So, Bellamy echoes Cricket, Luffy echoes Blackbeard, Roger echoes no one, but who exactly echoes Enron? It's easy to make a comparison with Enaru to the Celestial Dragons, Korosei, and even Emu themselves, since they all are revered as gods, and sit above the clouds looking down upon the world below. The book that Ivankov reads from when stating Emu's dynasty name is even called Genesis the book from the Bible which opens with the creation of the world by God. As the story continues, it becomes more and more clear that those who bear the name of D are those who directly oppose the oppression instilled by the rule of those at the top of the world. After all, they are the natural enemies of the gods. This of course isn't exclusive to the people of Marijua, our number one rubber fellow was also referred to as God's natural enemy during his and Enaru's climactic battle in the sky. That's of course because Luffy's Devil Fruit was a natural counter to Enaru's, but that's when we thought Mr. Monkey D had eaten the simple Paramecia-type gum gum fruit, a particularly forgettable fruit that grants the user a body of rubber. We, of course, know better now. Luffy's Fruit is a mythical zone of the sun god Nika, who, coincidentally before Wano, was mentioned in Skypea and Skypea alone. With his Nika abilities, Luffy essentially turns into a Looney Tune and turns his fights into a Tom and Jerry escapade that seems impossible for his opponents to even get a grasp of the situation, let alone win against him. He becomes the most literal embodiment of freedom, becoming able to do nearly anything he wants, including manifesting goggles out of thin air. Do you mean to tell me that you could have taken your hand out of that cuff at any time? No, not at any time. Only when it was funny. <laughs> so, being a rubber man means that Luffy was the natural enemy of God in Skypea. What does that mean now that Luffy has become a literal god himself? If we say that Emu was the natural enemy of the sun god Nika, then what exactly does that look like? Well, we saw a glimpse of Emu's power in the latest chapter, as of the time writing this, and it was terrifying. Taking on the form of a hulking mass of darkness, even Sabo's fire attacks seemed impossibly weak in a hopeless situation, swallowed into a void of abyss never to see the sun again. He was forced to flee, but was unable to avoid being pierced by a cartoonishly evil, spade-like tail. That throne room which sits atop the highest point, the largest castle, the tallest peak of land, where the creatures once revered as gods were brought down by their new rulers, stealing their titles. It has now become a hellscape of despair. If Nika, if Luffy is the embodiment of all the world's hopes and dreams, then Emu must be the embodiment of oppression and depravity. Because Emu is not God. They're the devil. If Enaru's end goal was to ascend to the highest plane of existence, the moon himself, then the mirror of that must be to force every citizen of the world further down as you remain at the top. And for all intents and purposes, Emu has succeeded. Alabasta was an arc where the Straw Hats were attempting to thwart a warlord from usurping the throne of a country, but Dressrosa was an arc where they arrived at a country that had already been under the thumb of a warlord for years. Skypea was an arc about a man who had recently proclaimed himself as god and successfully subjugated Skypea to his rule, but was defeated by a resistance as he attempted to squash the final threats to that rule. Emu, centuries ago, has already defeated every enemy that stood in their way. The ancient kingdom, Joy Boy, the ancient weapons, every threat has already been dealt with, so they, and they alone, stood atop the world as its god, unchallenged. Luffy has always had a way of not understanding complicated situations, only really grasping the specific ways he is personally affected by them. This sense of morality has been constantly evolving throughout the series. In my last One Piece video I talk about this extensively, so feel free to check that out. Uh, the gist of it though is that Luffy doesn't typically help people who have accepted defeat and are complacent in their own suffering. 
but that mentality has shifted significantly as the story progresses. By now he has learned that there are cases where people, not even aware that they are prisoners living with the will of others thrusted upon them. We see this in Dress Rosa and even in Watt. So how do you think that Luffy is going to react when he realizes that someone out there decided that the world and all the people living in it belong to them? I don't think there's a single person out there who doesn't foresee Luffy kicking this shit out of Emo. The real question is what happens after. Proceeding with the hypothetical that Skypea will mirror the final arc, we need to focus on what happens at the end of Skypea. Luffy defeats Anaru, and in the same strike rings the Golden Bell of Shandor, an artifact that has been lost to time. An artifact whose ringing will bring an end to the centuries-old conflict between Shandorans and the Skypeans. So let's break down that first thought. A centuries-old conflict that could easily be the conflict between the ancient kingdom and the world government, but how did the quarrel between the Shandorans and Skypeans begin? Well, when the portion of the island of Jaya was blown into the sky by the knock-up stream, chaos almost instantly began. There was hardly even time to argue, it was just bloodshed. The Shandorans were confused as to how their home ended up in the sky and were doing their best to protect it. The Skypeans were excited to see Verth, soil, their most treasured resource, just abundantly delivered to them in a surplus they had never seen before. Both sides thought they were fighting a righteous battle, a battle for the survival of their own people. Who's to say that the war that took place in the Void Century was any different? I think most people have assumed by the way things are now that the world government was always this tyrannical force of evil, and the ancient kingdom was the hopeful engine of freedom. But does that really make complete sense? It's easy to look at the atrocities and war crimes that those that sit at the top perform on a daily basis and assume that this is the way things have always been. But remember, Emu once had 19 equals, and 800 years is a long, long time. Even if things only diluted at a rate of 1% per decade, a rate of change that is nearly impossible to notice. Still, give it enough time, and eventually the regime that you once believed in is unrecognizable. I think what actually happened is that there were two sides, and neither was particularly righteous or evil, it was just circumstance. Beings found themselves in a location rich with a resource absent to them. The others were protecting their home. And maybe those people came from the moon, which only had earth and wanted water. And that's why they came down to Earth, and that's why the Gorosei and the Agent Weapons are named after planets, and why the Celestial Dragons wear spacesuits, but that's a whole other topic that we don't really have time to get into today. So then one day, when nobody is strong enough to stop it, the god takes over, and everyone loses. Hell, Anaru even has five priests, and Emo has five saints. There are endless parallels and endless verbs. So with the parallels to the conflict arranged, what could be struck in order to signify peace throughout the world of One Piece? Now, I actually think this is something that might not have been revealed yet, so we can only really go on the information that we have. Until then, the only logical conclusion I can imagine is the empty throne. The golden bell signified hope, unity, peace, and adventure. And the empty throne is the absence of all those things. Originally meant to signify that no single person rules the world, it has been contorted into exactly what it intentionally mocked. Not to mention that if Luffy hits Emu hard enough, they would crash through the whole thing and even take the red line down with them in the same blow, which would of course unite the world and cure two Chekhov's guns in the story, which are Fishman Island being destroyed and the All Blue being formed. So after the Golden Bell was rung, what happened in Skypea? All parties that once held grudges, animosity, or fervor towards one another abandoned those negative emotions and had a blowout party extravaganza together. So we should expect the same, but on a much grander scale, a party where everyone in the entire world gets an invitation. I even think it's not out of the question that Laugh Tale is an island that is just absolutely equipped to throw the biggest rager of all time, which would be why Roger and everyone laughed so hard when they got there. Just imagine it. You think you're going to find some legendary treasure, some artifact lost to time, but instead, it's 3,000 cases of Everclear and enough cocaine to make Zunisha OD. All tied together by an automaton DJ running on that infinite energy source Vegapunk has been chasing this whole time. But Roger was too early to have that party because... For some reason, he needed all three ancient weapons before he could host it. However, Luffy is right on time. And once the oppressors of the world are taken down, he will call everyone over to that final island to play Flip Cup and Birio Kart. 
all the racism, all the poverty, all the hatred in the world has vanished because nobody feels like fighting anymore. And it will be at that moment that we have found One Piece. It's surreal being able to theorize how something that's always been a part of my life will end. And not only that, but actually having enough pieces in place where I feel like I can semi-accurately pinpoint how it will go. But I think that it's more important that when that final chapter releases and Oda can finally hug his children, we don't cry in the wake of absence. We smile for the cherished moments past. Let's all sing it with a dawn, a song of the waves. Doesn't matter who you are, someday you'll just be bones. Never ending, ever wandering, our funny, traveling tale. The day that the journey with the Straw Hats ends will mean that all of their dreams will have been realized. Every disease is cured, a world map is drawn, and the bravest warrior the sea has ever known will be born. Other than freedom, dreams have to be the most important theme in One Piece. In One Piece, dreams hold the potential to shape one's destiny, foster personal growth, ignite change, and inspire others. They encourage individuals to embrace themselves, pursue limitless ambition through determination, and find meaning in the journey towards their own realization. Realistically, every single one of us that were a part of this journey are a member of that crew. We are all Nakama. And the story can't truly end until your dream has also reached its fruition. So until you reach that final island, until every member of the crew has fulfilled their dream, the funny traveling tale will continue to be told. So I'll meet you there, and one day we can have that party ourselves. And before I leave, let me remind you of the words stated by a certain pirate right before Skypea begins. <laughs> Oh, I love you!